Presentation? Yeah. Uh, my PowerPoint? Mm -hmm. You displayed here, right?
잠시 후 4시 50분부터 행사를 계속 진행할 예정이오니 로비에 계신 참석자 여러분께서는 다시 멀티홀 내부로 들어오셔서 착석해 주시기 바랍니다. 다시 한번 알려드립니다. 잠시 후 We are going to start in three minutes, uh, beginning 3.50. So I'd like to invite everybody to come inside and take their seats. 바랍니다. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, from 4.50, we will resume the symposium. Those of you who are still outside, you are kindly asked to enter the room and take your seats. And please leave all the refreshments and snacks outside. You are not allowed to bring drinks or snacks in this room.
안녕하십니까. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We will now resume the symposium co-organized by MMCA and EPLUX Architecture under the theme of superhumanity. Thank you once again for attending uh, this symposium. We will now proceed. I'd like to ask all the uh, participants to enter the room and take your seats. Simultaneous uh, interpretation is provided, uh, Korean on channel one and English on channel two. I'd also like to ask you to kindly switch your cell phones to the silent or vibrant mode. This symposium is being broadcast live. Now I'd like to introduce Professor Beatrice Colomina, who will be introducing the speakers. She is an authoritative scholar on architecture and architectural history, and she uses many different approaches to research. She is also an author of many books. She has Klimp Stamford Hold and looks at public and private things as well as uh, architecture at large. She is a scholar of, of she is a scholar of extended architecture as well. I'd like to introduce her and uh, please uh, welcome her with a warm round of applause. <laughs> Hello, I'm uh, super happy to be here, be part of this uh, uh, wonderful uh, conference, and I'm also very happy to introduce the panel on uh, post labor uh, and the three uh, great speakers that will uh, present on their different expertise. Since I am from the field of uh, architecture, I would like uh, first to introduce with uh, a few thoughts about the architecture of uh, post labor because I think uh, there are uh, clear uh, spatial implications to this new uh, condition that we were discussing also uh, with the previous uh, speaker. I was myself struck uh, a few years uh, ago with this question and the architectural implications of, uh, of this question when I read by chance in the, in the Wall Street Journal that 80% 80% of uh, young professionals uh, uh, in New York City uh, were working regularly from their beds. And this uh, was actually 2012. So we are talking, uh, it's not moving. It's perhaps a different button. What's this one? Oh, you are going the, the other way around then. Yeah. Okay, so it's going down. Okay, so, so, so I was struck by the fact that 80%, 80% of young professionals in New York were working for bed. And as I said, this is a, a newspaper article, uh, the Wall Street Journal in 2012. So it's probably by now a very, very conservative estimate. So what is the result of this? That millions actually of dispersed uh, uh, beds are taken over from concentrated uh, office uh, buildings. Uh, the boudoir, in other words, is defeating uh, the tower. Now, for me as a historian, the question is how did we get to this point? And again, for me, the reference, uh, as it has been for the previous speaker, uh, turned out to be Walter Benjamin, who in a very short text called Louis Philippe or the Interior, he talks about precisely the splitting of work and home in the 19th century. And he says a very famous essay. Under Louis Philippe, the private citizen enters the stage of history. For the private person, living space becomes for the first time antithetical to the place of work. The former is constituted by the interior, and the office is his complement. And then he goes on to say that from there spring the phantasmagorias of the interior. For the private individual, the private environment represents the universe. In it, it gathers remote places and the past. His living room is a box in the world theater. Well, clearly, industrialization brought with it, as we all know, the eight-hour uh, work shift and the radical separation between place uh, of living and place of work, between home and office, or home and factory, between rest and work, uh, or between play and work, we will say now, between night and day. 
post-industrialization seems to be uh, collapsing uh, work back into the home and further into the bedroom and into the bed itself. So phantasmagoria is no longer in the living room, in the wallpaper, in the fabrics, in the images and objects, as Benjamin will uh, talk about, but it's now in the electronic devices. The whole universe is, seems to be concentrated on this very small uh, screen with the bed somehow for, floating in an infinite sea of information. The bed is now a site of action, and the wall stays uh, on the wall stays rather than simply observing the wall as the interior of Walter Benjamin. And of course, there are many precedents for, for this that I don't have time to go in, but think, for example, about Hugh Hefner, who uh, died uh, recently, and here you have him working in bed in the, um, in the uh, 50s when he started to do the magazine. He already kind of inaugurated the idea of the bed as, a play, as an office, right? We're full of, uh, of all kinds of media uh, equipment. As if in response to these uh, new realities uh, of, of today, uh, returning to our time, office spaces are being domesticated to, with a sleeping pot, yet the sharing economy reinforced by social media is producing new urban typologies that blur public and private. The ubiquitous, uh, ubiquitous uh, cell phone means that people are constantly carrying private spaces between them, but also engaging in new forms of collectivity, navigating the city and interacting with it on the basis of feedback from huge numbers of people. All the traditional divisions of the city, urban behaviors and ways of understanding space have been profoundly uh, transformed. Actually, we la now live in a kind of hybrid space that is both physical and digital. I mean, like, where are uh, these people? On the one hand, you can say, okay, maybe they are waiting for a for a metro, for a train somewhere in Asia, but at the same time, they are also in another kind of a space that we all inhabit now uh, without uh, thinking. The 19th uh, century division of the city uh, between rest and work may soon, as it also became obvious in the previous uh, presentation, obsolete. Not only have our habits and our habitat, which is important for architects, changed with the internet and social media, but predictions about the end of human labor in the wake of new technologies and robotization are no longer treated as futuristic. Already uh, 30 years ago, this uh, economist, uh, 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 Vasiliev uh, Leontief, um, wrote about uh, 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 this. He said, they replaced horses, didn't they? Uh, and, and nobody took him uh, uh, seriously. He basically said that the human worker will go the way of the horse. Uh, he ended up getting the Nobel Prize, but nobody paid much attention. But recently, the New York Times reconsidered the idea of the end of the human work ha horse, house, sorry, and he wrote, horse hung around in the labor force for quite some time after they were first challenged by modern communication technologies like the telegraph and the railroad, hauling staff and people around farms and cities. But be when the internal combustion engine came along, horses as a critical component of the world economy were history. Humans as war horses might also be on the way uh, out. Economists, of course, wonder what kind of economic model this reality will lead to from growing inequalities with vast amount of people unemployed to large-scale uh, redistributions in the form of the universal basic income, which was considered in a refer referendum in Switzerland, as you know, and rejected only a couple of years ago. It was rejected, but the fact that it was considered should already be telling us uh, uh, something. As, as you probably know, multiple trials of this basic uh, income uh, universal income are underway in places from California uh, to Finland. The end of paid labor and its replacement with creative leisure, ironically, was already envisioned in utopian projects that we have mentioned before also of the 60s and 70s by Constant, by Super Studio, by Archizun, um, by Archigram. Those are all projects uh, that I have images now on the screen from Archigram, for example, that all uh, have these hyper-equipped uh, beds. Uh, and now that uh, this reality is upon us, it seems like we, as architects, are not thinking, uh, as designers, not thinking too much about it. But in, in the meantime, the city itself has started to redesign itself. In today's attention deficit disorder, we have discovered that we work better in short bursts punctured by uh, uh, rest. 
And today, many companies provide sleeping pods that are actually remarkably similar uh, to the uh, projects of the uh, 1960s. These pods are, are um, included in offices to maximize productivity. Bed and office are never far apart in the 24-7 world. A sleep itself has been colonized by the marketplace. Between the bed inserted in the office and the office inserted in the bed, a whole new horizontal architecture has taken over in a collapse of traditional distinctions between private and public, between work and play, between rest and action. So with this, I will leave you with the three speakers of this afternoon. And then Nick Axel, who is sitting next here next to me, will moderate the discussion. I know this is not what is in the program, but we have to rearrange because Nicholas couldn't be uh, here. So let me, I'm very happy to uh, uh, introduce you to Yuk uh, Hui, who is currently researcher of the project Techno Ecologies of Participation at the Leofana University Lunenburg, where he also teaches at the Institute for Philosophy. He's a visiting professor at the China Academy of Art and a member of the International Center of Simondon Studies in Paris. He has published on philosophy of technology and media, as the author of, uh, of several books, including on the existence of digital objects, uh, the question concerning technology in China, and also is co-editor of 30 years after Les Immaterial, uh, Art, Science and Theory. Then we have Kim Yahi, Yahi who is visiting professor of Sun Kun, Kun Kwan University and has researched the contemporary French philosophy, philosophy of technology and posthumanism. She's a PhD in, from the Seoul uh, National University and has worked as research professor at Edward Women's University. And her main books are Simon Don's on Simon Don's uh, philosophy of technology. Henry Bergson, Conception of Virtual Unconscious and Matter and Memory, Movement of Repetition and Difference. Finally, uh, Hiroshi Yamakawa uh, is Director of Duango Artificial Intelligence Laboratory and a Chairperson of the Whole Brain Architecture Initiative, as well as Director and Managing Editor of the Japanese Society for Artificial Intelligence. He's also a visiting professor of Graduate School of Information System. His area of expertise is artificial intelligence, in, particularly, uh, in particular cognitive architecture, concept acquisition, neurocomputing, and opinion aggregation uh, technology. Uh, please join me to welcome the uh, speakers and Nick Axel. Do I, need, do I need this one? Yes, I need this one. Okay. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Okay. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, and for the organization of this, this event. Um, uh, because I only have 20 minutes, so I will straight forward to the, uh, to the, uh, to the, to the presentation uh, on post-labor condition. Reading mass fragments on machines with Simon Don, but this is probably not a good, very good title. But first, before I start, I would like to st um, start with two points. The first point is that um, is the question of labour is not my principal research, but uh, so therefore I will emphasise on the on, rather on the question of the condition of post labour. And uh, I believe, and I try to we try to convince you that the question of labour is only one phase of technological development. Therefore, post-labor um, is a product of a new condition, and post-labor doesn't mean that there is no labor, but rather labor takes another form. And post means that we don't really know what it is yet. Um, now the second point is that I, the second point is that I think that uh, it's really important as a philosopher, as a critic, to identify problems. Uh, so therefore, I also don't believe that there is, on the one hand, uh, a kind of Simon Don's uh, or op op optimism of Simon Don, a pessimism, pessimism of uh, Stigler. I think that we have to identify problems um, instead of just celebrating or lamenting. Um, so let me. 
start with this question of automation that one of the uh, audience has posed, uh, has raised um, earlier. Now, this is a picture of uh, automation in a restaurant in China that uh, I think that was implemented uh, a few months ago. So what you can do really is that you go into a restaurant, you use your mobile phone, and then you scan the barcode, you order with your smartphone, and then come comes the robot and then you finish your after you finish your, your meal you pay with your smartphone. Now there is no uh, no human being involved in this service. Uh, when we, I'm saying this, this is of course not only happened uh, in China, because as we know, the artificial intelligence and automation is going to be the main area of competition internationally among different nation states. So, for example, this um, in in August, um, China launched a white paper which says that China wants to become the leading country of AI in 2030. And then China is going to introduce AI uh, in primary school. Now, on the 1st of September, then the Putin responds to that. Uh, uh, he says to the, to the Russian children that whoever lives in AI will rule the world. No. So, uh, what, I'm going to, what I'm trying to say here is that um, the question of automation um, is going to be a, a huge problem, a huge question that we have to, to, to address. And it will determine, for it is also the condition of uh, what we call post-labor, the condition of um, um, reproduction of capital, and also geopolitics. And this is especially the question of geopolitics is important here. Now, um, what are we going to, to do with uh, automation? Here, I would like to revisit two elements that was uh, pronounced by Karl Marx in Femmes on Machines, and to resituate these two elements uh, that Marx talked about. One is uh, fixed capital, second, free time uh, in our new condition, and then we try to go further, see what we can do with that, uh, uh, mainly uh, through the critique of Simondon. Now, in, in the fragments on machines, there was an appendix uh, in the Grundrisse. Marx, actually also in capital, Marx make a difference between two uh, capitals. One, circulating capital, meaning uh, uh, the circulation of um, material, of wage, and on the other hand, fixed capital, which we call dead labor. Uh, now, fixed capital, by fixed capital, Marx re refers to machines. This is, I summarize the thesis of Marx here. Uh, uh, Marx says that capitalism wants to invest more and more on automation, on automated technology, in order to reduce what he calls necessary labor time. That is to say, the time needed to produce a product. By reducing the necessary, necessary labor time, he actually, we capitalists can increase what he called uh, surplus labor. Now, at one moment, Marx says that you can, we, the um, surplus labor corresponds to surplus value. Uh, so there is kind of equivalence here. Uh, but towards the end of this fragment, Marx raised a very interesting question, and that we have still to think about that, is that Marx uh, pop, um, speculates on uh, dialectics. That is to say, is it possible to sublate surplus value, uh, surplus labor to what he called free time? <coughs> now, the question of free time is very interesting and very important in the work of Marx. Now, uh, we can all even refer to what Marx called the free man. I cite quoted here what he says uh, with Ingers in German ideology. Uh, he, here he refers to communist society. Uh, it makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow to hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rail cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, just as I have a mind without ever becoming hunter, fishman, herdsman, or critique. Is this play? No, I will show you. <laughs> um, second, uh, the second element, uh, well, but we have to reevaluate re what I said before 
on the one hand, a fixed capital. On the other hand, free time in the new framework that we have to address today. First, fixed capital. Now, we, uh, the capital, the fixed capital that Musk describes today is no longer machines in, the fa in, in factories, but rather this is a fixed capital. This smartphone is a fixed capital, and it belongs to me, and I work with that. You know? And uh, not only that machines are everywhere, these fixed capitals are everywhere, but also the whole factory that was where the, these machines in uh, has already escalated to the whole society uh, with smart devices, sensors, neural networks, and we know a lot of uh, the question of or the, the projects of smartification with smart objects, smart homes, smart cities, uh, which has already happened in Korea. So we have to evaluate what Musk called a fixed capital. Second, free time uh, versus, uh, versus play. Uh, now we have to make clear that, uh, for example, for Marx, free time is not play and labor. Uh, uh, here, because Marx was criticizing uh, Charles Fourier by saying that labor cannot become play, uh, as Fourier would like. Although it remains his great contribution to have expressed this suspension, not of distribution, but of the mode of production itself, in a higher form as the ultimate object. Now, okay, here, Marx rejects the question of labor as uh, play. And free time is not uh, non-labor. Free time is not opposed to labor, but rather, uh, and here, Marx is really ambiguous with the question of labor. And free time could be seen as a kind of labor. It is both idle time and time for higher activity. Now, what does it mean by higher activity? Here, we should raise the question of knowledge and knowledge production. Um, so here, these are the two elements I propose that we have to reevaluate concerning what Marx uh, calls um, uh, the, the speculation that Marx has raised. And as the, uh, the, the, the speaker, earlier speaker, has pointed out that the question how the question of play uh, um, is, has, become, has become the center of labor. Huh? So actually, this is not, uh, is not communist or which uh, communism didn't propose to have uh, play as a, a replacement of labor. Rather, uh, uh, that was the vision of uh, Charles Fourier, not Marx. That's uh, something we have to distinguish. So because the, the earlier speaker has made this point really clear, so I will skip this, uh, this part. Um, and, but just to say that we have seen in the past decades how uh, they, how the play and labor has blurred. You know? And this is symptomatic because it is also um, our, our quotidian life has become uh, a mode of production of, cap of capital as well as consumption. Um, but regarding Marx's three, um, the, the, the Marx's um, uh, speculation, that is to say, the dialectics from surplus labor to free time. In the past uh, 100 years, we, we can see three propositions here, here we will read together. Firstly, to seize the means of production, such as in very socialist collective projects, for example, uh, cultural revolution in China. Second, to transform surplus labor into a form of resistance and the general intellect into multitude, as outlined in the work of thinkers like Tony Negri and Paolo Venner. Third, which was, uh, repeat, which was um, uh, very much discussed in the recent years, is to accelerate towards full automation, implement universal income and the ethics of working less, as in the, already in the situationist and more recently, Accelerationist. Uh, now, we, um, if we follow the, this, uh, this, uh, the third um, proposition, that is to say, to uh, realize full automation as a possibility to implement uh, uh, what Marx may, may call uh, communist society, uh, it will be problematic for us uh, to uh, still to think of the question of labor. Uh, and there, I would like to introduce a critique um, of Simondon uh, to problematize these um, ideas or these approaches um, 
especially the third one. Now here is the, 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 the critique is the following. If in the, these three propositions, we can see actually machines, what must called fixed capitals, are only economic categories. Fixed capital in Marx analysis is largely only economic category. And here I would like to introduce uh, uh, Simon Don's critique of Marx, and I hope that by doing this, we can think much further than this mere celebration or this I utopian idea of, um, uh, of, of, um, of liberation. Now, in Simon Don's, uh, Simon Don criticized Marx precisely on this point that Marx's analysis of fixed capital is very limited to economic categories. And he proposed that actually what, uh, there is something which is more fundamental that Marx didn't touch upon, is uh, what he says here. Under this juridical and economic relation, there is a more profound and more essential relation, which is, which is the continuity between human individual and technical individual, or the discontinuity between these two beings. Now we have to, have to explain this sentence, but may, can I know how much time do I have? No one is counting. Don't worry, so I continue. Uh, so um, we have to understand this sentence because Simon Don is trying to say where well, there is a kind of alienation. And this alienation is not from, uh, you cannot understand this alienation only from the perspective of fixed capital or machine as an economic category. There is something which is more profound. And we have to take into account of this and which Marx didn't touch upon. Now, what it is this? Uh, what is this um, more profound relation that he was referring to? Now, uh, and what he, when he says that human individual and technical individual, uh, we have to pay attention soon to the word technical individual. What does he really mean by, by that here? Now, let me give you a, a, a really very brief um, um, idea of what does he mean, what he means by by this. Imagine that a work a worker. Uh, uh, artisan, art, an artisan in the time of Marx, was forced to leave his atelier, to force to leave his atelier to enter into factory to work there. By doing so, he can no longer access access to his uh, his skill, his uh, capacity that he has developed. Uh, but only only at the same time, because working with these machines, he the worker subsumed himself to the predefined procedures and the rhythm of the machine. Worse still, because the worker does not have knowledge how this machine works, now he also only repeats certain gesture to finish the task. This is the, the real source of alienation. This is the real source of alienation. And the economic, the economic factor is only what amplifies such alienation. But because the, the worker does not have knowledge to, of these machines and only treat these machines as slave, that creates an alienation of machine. So here we see a double alienation as psychopathology of the industrial uh, capitalism uh, at the time of Marx. And of course, this has to be re-evaluated um, today. Um, Now, Simon Long proposed that in order to overcome this problem, we have to think of the question of technical knowledge. And what does it mean by technical knowledge here? It means that the workers have to know what, how, to, how this machine works uh, in order to, um, in order to um, uh, for example, repair and maintain these machines. At the same time, that we should also develop a new relation with these machines. And what does it mean by that, a new relation? It means that we have to overcome this, on the one hand, uh, the self-alienation of worker and alienation of machines. 
Here is what he says when a very strange comment on, at the very beginning of uh, Simon Don's book on the mode of existence of technical objects. He says, we precisely would like to show that robots does not exist and that it is not a machine as much as a state a statue is not a living being but only a product of imagination, of fictive fabrication and of the art of illusion. Uh, how can we think of the fact that actually um, so here, here, uh, because in the um, in the imagination of robots, you know, we always try to, um, tends to understand these machines as slaves, as something which work for us, as for example in full automation. Then the human being will be separated from machines who are. Uh, working 24 hours, seven days in the factories, you know, and we are liberated. Uh, so that is why Simon Don says that you know we have to, we shouldn't think of an um, uh, um, to think of robots as uh, servants or as slaves. But rather, and this means something else, something more important for us is that we should stop or we should uh, um, we shouldn't think of a kind of human machine mirror relations so the machine is not a human no. and what does it mean by uh, working then we have to think about working with machine instead of uh, thinking machine will flatten us or will become a, uh, will, will, will kill us and but this is something we should uh, talk during the discussion this I will skip. Uh, now, because we know that robot does exist, and these are the robots. This is a Samsung robot. This is a, 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 a Simo robot, and this is a very strange Chinese robot. Uh, I don't know if anyone recommend this this person. That's actually a robot, and it is a, a really famous Neo Confucian uh, philosopher, very popular also here in Korea, Wang Yamin. But then the Chinese has to build a robot, and this uh, uh, this robot Wang Yamin is able to write calligraphy uh, as if uh, in his uh, his own style. Uh. So so far, what we are trying to say is that labor is only one of the phases of the genesis of technicity of technology. Let's to say labor is only one of the one of the uh, one of the phases of the technological development. Second, technological or technical activity is a category much larger than that of labor, and that's, we have to think about that. And technological knowledge must be developed and acquired to overcome alienation. And I think this is a very important question for us. Uh, what does it really mean by technological knowledge today? Uh, um, and I will come back to this. And the fourth point, a new relation between human and non-human, including machines, must be developed. Now, let me try to finish this, because I only have five minutes to, uh, to uh, address what is the technological knowledge. And I think it is very important for us to think of this question. Uh, now, what is technological knowledge? And refer to this. Uh, uh, this quote from Donald Trump uh, when he res responds to uh, the uh, hacking uh, activity of Russia last year. He said, I think that computers have complicated lives very greatly. The whole age of computer has made it where nobody knows exactly what is going on. Now, what is this symp symptomatic uh, verdict of Trump? You know, it's a very... It's true because, in fact, there are many things that we don't know how they are functioning now, eh? like many algorithms, they are black blocks. They are black blocks. But it doesn't really mean that these black blocks are necessarily bad, but rather we have to think of uh, uh, what we can do with, with them. Uh, now, so with the question of technological knowledge today, it is surely not... I mean, we have to reflect on this question because of this is this doesn't mean simply that we have to uh, learn how to use a machine or how the machine works. Uh, no, I would like to make this in to summarize this uh, because it's a huge question. But I would like to summarize in two points. One is the relation between technologies and humanities. And I think this is a question we have to address today because we talk very often of the crisis of humanities. 
why I believe that in order to uh, uh, um, in the in the in the post uh, in the post labor condition, we have to think of this relation again, and uh, to overcome this division of discipline, which was uh, is um, traumatic and uh, problematic in the past centuries. Now, and I refer to one of the. Um, the uh, uh, what what uh, Vienna says in in his book Cybernetics, he once says that he was working with uh, colleagues from the same department, uh, and they have an uh, office in the same corridor. But he found it was not possible to talk to colleagues of the same discipline because the discipline is so divided that it's even difficult for them to have a fruitful conversation. That is why he proposed the cybernetic model as a discipline which is possible to unify other disciplines. Uh, but of course today the question of cybernetic is considered to be, you know, to, is related with control and surveillance and so on and so forth. But I think that it is also the possibility or uh, invitation for us to think of with these new technologies and uh, smart objects, how can we uh, think of the, of the new program of education, a uh, new way of dissemination of knowledge and not limit to two poles, one is the users of machines, one is, one is the uh, uh, hackers, inventors of machines. And technological knowledge doesn't mean at all uh, how to repair machines, but it needs something more profound, and this has to be rethought. Now, the, the, the last point, one well, minute, good, uh, is that concerning the last point, that uh, technological knowledge is not about repairing machines, I would like to emphasize also what I called the difference between reappropriation and uh, repurposing. And I think this, is, uh, this, this distinction had to, to be made uh, clearly. So repurposing, we say that we uh, use um, we use Facebook to do something that Facebook is not supposed to do. For example, we use Facebook to organize social, um, uh, to organize protest uh, social activities. But reappropriating is uh, means something else because I want to make a difference between technology and application of technology. Now, Facebook is an application of technology, but what is behind Facebook? For example, network protocols, uh, uh, algorithms. These are technologies, and I think that uh, as of uh, technological knowledge, uh, we um, we have to. I mean, as a re as a response to the short-sighted uh, capitalism and industrialization that the professor uh, has mentioned earlier, we must reappropriate these technologies in order to uh, create. Uh, something different, something which is in favor of our uh, uh, common aims, our collecti uh, co collective aims. And only by this we are able to anticipate, to develop different technological futures and different alternative models. And here I would like to, to just to finish with the last sentence that in the, in, uh, the developments that we have today at the very beginning as related to geopolitics is that uh, every country is competing towards technological singularity. And this is a very sim symptomatic uh, uh, progress or development in human history. And I think that uh, the question of technological knowledge, the question of post uh, labor uh, condition uh, is an invitation for us to reflect on the possibility of the bifurcation of technological futures, uh, but not just uh, at one end as one telos of, hum of humanities, if we can say so. So I stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to introduce Professor Kim Jae-hee from song University, who will make his presentation. It's good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. There was a question that emerged during Professor Jin's uh, 
session that was what will come after exploited play. That's probably uh, asking whether there is a possibility of a post-labor society. And as uh, Professor Yuki say, what is the condition for post-labor? I think these questions are interlinked. I would like to approach this issue uh, from the point of uh, the relationship between machine and uh, humans. As uh, Professor Yuki said, I would also like to refer to Gilbert Chibondon, a philosopher of France, as well as uh, Bernard Stiegler, another philosopher that continued on with the same thought. We will uh, look at this issue from these point of views. Uh, uh, however, unlike the previous speakers, Oh, so you have all downloaded my materials. Then uh, since I am using many philosophical terms and I want to save time, I will be reading mostly from my paper. Since you have downloaded my paper, then you can uh, look at it while I read. So I will now proceed. You are not ready? Have you not downloaded the material yet? All right, I will proceed. Post-human society and technical al alienation. With the emergence of information technology and cybernetics, it became possible to see humans and machines at the same information conveyance and feedback control system. This, in turn, made it possible to humanize machines and machinize humans at the same time while opening up a discussion of the post-human. The post-humanization of the human and evolutionary process founded upon the investments of science and technology evokes both anticipation and apprehension. While humans largely welcome the utility and conveyance of weak artificial intelligence, such as IBM Watson or Google's AlphaGo, they fear that superior non-human beings, such as strong artificial intelligence and artificial superintelligence, will someday come to dominate humans. Similarly, while the transhumanization or cyborganization that removes disabilities and enhances physical and mental capabilities might be welcomed, the machinization of desire and thought and its subjection to computers that turn everything into data through algorithm algorithmic language might be feared. This fear of post-humanization is especially pronounced when it comes to the question of alienation that surrounds the topic of labor. The idea that machines and robots could replace humans who would end up being simplistic machines or even completely useless in the face of automated systems seems to have struck a nerve in a public discourse. But do machines actually cause alienation of labor? If machines indeed replace human labor, does it mean, does it not mean that humans should and would be able to engage in activities other than labor? The transition from a human society to a post-human society transforms not only the relationship between humans and machines, but also the concept of labor itself. Should we not then be looking at the possibility of post-labor condition in which humans and machines do not confront and struggle against each other around labor, but are able to work together as post-humans instead? Labor, alienation, and technology. In the late 1950s, Gilbert Simondo pointed out the limitations of labor communities and worked to solve resolve the problem of alienation due to mechanization and automation. He traces the origin of alienation to the emergence of factories and the transition from handicraft to machination in the 19th century. Yet unlike Marx, who identifies the locus of alienation in the opposition between labor and capital around the ownership of means of production. Simon Don focuses on the physio psychological discontinuity between the human labor and the technical object being worked with. In other words, when the craftman, craftsmen uh, are able to move tools with their own body and feel the accuracy of their motions, there was no such alienation because he was directly connected with the technical objects. But when the individuated technical objects stopped extending human motion and became automated, humans lost this quality of relation. 
Simondon believed that this alienation could not be explained in the context of labor in opposition of capital. While the asymmetrical construct of capital and labor is certainly a precondition for distorting the relationship between humans and machines, non-ownership further alienates machine and workers. Simon Don emphasized the fact that humans, whether a worker or a capitalist, can no longer gauge automated technical objects in a direct way. Alienation occurs because humans play the role of tool movers for a long time and perceive themselves as technical objects in so much as they feel that automated machines have taken this role away from humans. As machines increasingly became not tools in and of themselves but tool movers, humans were relieved of craft work and were left to either organize or assist the operations of machines. They oil machines, dispose waste, replace parts. In other words, they become the servants taking care of machines or managers adjusting the relationship between machines. Does this situation, which makes humans not a direct subject of labor, but assistants or managers of the working machines, inevitably alienate them? Or can we understand this discontinuity as the emergence of a new relationship based not on alienation from labor, but rather de-labor? Simondon's solution was not to antagonize, but reestablishing the relationship between human and technical objects and recovering continuity. According to Simon Don, what is necessary is to get rid of the paradigm of labor. Labor is a concept that was suitable when technical objects were only tools or instruments and had to be moved by humans. Yet, when technical objects evolved to become automated individuals, the relationship between humans and machines should no longer be seen as labor. Instead, the relationship must be understood at the level of a more fundamental and comprehensive technical activity. Technical activity cannot be confined to labor. It is not about simple use of machines, but comprises of all general creative activities such as inventing, repairing, and adjusting machines. Technical activity is an interaction that creates or adjusts the working relationship between things that are different and inconsistent. Transitioning from a social paradigm of labor to one of technical activity requires a fundamental change in the way we understand life as being oriented by substance to being oriented by relations. In this sense, it is necessary to eradicate hierarchical segmentation and social prejudices that obstruct communication and relationships within technical activities. Technical activities presume not only a symmetrical, synergic relationship between humans and technical objects, but also a fair and collaborative relationship amongst humans. Alienation will disappear if machines can successfully mediate and communicate between humans who work above and below them and when technical organization and technical activities take place in tandem. In other words, when a machine is moved and manipulated by human hands, then fear can be eliminated and Simon Don believes that we can redirect the direction of relationship between uh, technology and uh, people. In other words, in the 20th century, and rather than being humans as laborers who become debilitated by machines, we need to establish a trans-individual relationship between machine and human. Trans-individual relationship is not the conventional social relationship between individuals based on division of labor. Trans-individual exists on the level of communication based on the pre-individual potentials mediated by technical objects to create new significations and emotional sympathies across conventional orders of society. Simon Don believe that human society could evolve from biological groupings based on division of labor to a trans-individual collective based on creative and technical activities. Capital technology and critical literacy. However, Bernard Stiegler criticizes Simondo's view as being overly optimistic and overlooking the relationship between technology and capital. Unlike Simondon, According to Stiegler, digital networks produces disindividuated agents of consumption and widespread cognitive and mental alienation. 
Modes of cultural production and consumption that utilize digital networks have industrialized uh, NUMA techniques in order to answer the categorical imperative of capitalism. NUMA techniques uh, serve the political economy of the consumer society and contributes to the production of a homogenous and uniform collective consciousness. The resulting public are individuals who have lost singularity, who serve the interest of the market more than their own, very much like Delusian individuals in the control society. I am no longer a unique individual with one body, but a mere data bank which provides and screens in order to operate the computer network. I search data, but am also a part of it. I am nothing but the owner and consumer of data. I, as an individual, can no longer make a we, a group of unique individual eyes, but rather becomes an unspecified one which has lost their singularities. One is the loss and liquidation of individuality. The one composed of de-individualized individuals deletes to the becoming anthropod of human society. That is, humans have become something between an ant covered with prosthetics and a spider eating itself in the midst of a network. The society has become merely a multi-agent system akin to that of insects. The pre-individual nature becomes technological industrial with humanity, symbolic, mental, and motor functions now externalized through technological prosthesis, which in turn control and manipulate the human body. In this hyper-industrial age, in particular labor, the laborer is gradually de-individualized by machines. From fragmented workers to the stressed top executives, motivation declines, instrumentalization is accelerated, and labor is depreciated. Symbolic misery is the same for a worker at a remote job site or a company executive. The proletariat of the hyperindustrial age have lost their knowledge and executive ability to control machines and in turn have become the tools of them. The laborer is deprived not only of a savoir faire but also savoir vivre. How then in an age where digital information networks act in collusion with consumer capitalism do we overcome the poverty of the human mind and comprehensive proletarianization? A Stiegler solution to provide attentional care for the human mind and foster critical literacy towards the emergent technological environment. He claims that deprived spirits need to be revived, intergenerational disconnections need to be restored, Short-term impulses need to be converted into long circuits of desire. Furthermore, Stiegler states that we need to cultivate critical thinking so that we may resist a network culture that is controlled and homogenized by capital interests and build a new socio-technological network, one that incorporates fundamental human values such as spirit and desire. However, Stiegler's solution is limited in that it does not deviate from the Enlightenment tradition based on anthropocentric uh, humanism. Critical transformations of the preconditions for trans-individuation, cl those currently under overdetermined by industrialized and pneumotechnical media, and the rearticulation of the relationship between the I and the we, will only be effective when resting upon more fundamental Simondonian planning to integrate inventive technical activities beyond the level of labor and alienation, post-labor and technical activity. Simondon intended to resolve the problem of alienation, which emerged as the age of uh, thermodynamic energy transition to one of information technology during the turn of the century by establishing a technical culture based on the collaborative coexistence between humans and machines. Stiegler, on the other hand, believes that the poverty of spiritual culture that has appeared in the post-20th century hyper-industrial age was to be overcome by recovering critical literacy. Although neither Simon Don nor Stiegler took aim at the question of alienation and labor in a post-human society as such, the appropriate form of post-labor probably lies between Simon Don's planning, planning and Stiegler's prescription. In other words, Simon Don's argument that the paradigm of life should be shifted from labor to technical activities is still valid for envisioning post-labor in a post-human society. But uh, the critical interventions of Stiegler are a necessary condition for Simon Donian post-labor to be realized. Following the Simon Don Stiegler insight, we need to first disassociate technical activities from productive labor in order to think about post-labor in terms of technical activities. 
First of all, we need to break out of the labor capital frame of mind, which only regards technical activities as means to improve productivity and limits the relationship with technical objects as that of ownership. Technical activities must be taken out of the domain of productivity and utility and reestablished as the capacity to recognize and invent new relationships with heterogeneous things. There is a need to reestablish uh, there is a need to establish social, cultural, and political economic conditions that allow anyone to freely choose, make, invent, and repair their own technical objects and to relate to the world in a different manner. If the transition from labor to post labor is to contribute to the enhancement of human potential and evolution through post humanization, technical activity must be separated from capital productivity to reveal its creative nature. We also need to escape from the frame of labor leisure. If labor is traditionally represented making a living or acting in public, then leisure represents free time to rest, think, study, and play. However, even if we are talking about uh, scole or OTM in its true sense, and not the modern sense of leisure driven by consumption, leisure as an opposition to labor is not sufficient in our thinking of post-labor. The technical activity of invention is not captured when labor and leisure are placed in opposition to each other. Moreover, if a school or contemplation are appreciated as cognitive abilities, it only further reduces the technical activity to labor, and it overlooks the fact that perception of reality is better achieved through inventive operations such as technical activity and not contemplation. We are moving from a human-oriented society based on labor to a post-human society based on technical activities. The post-human society is preconditioned on mutually collaborative coexistence of humans and technical objects. Humans and machines should no longer compete over labor, but find a way to coexist in the realm of technical activities. The dominate dominated relationship between humans as actors of labor and machines and tools for labor must be replaced by a mutually cooperative relationship between the post-human with biological origin and post-human with artificial origin. Both humans and non-humans are post-humans who must adjust their relationship within the world and post-labor technical activity as a precondition for the new individuation. Post-humans are not to be laborers, but in trans individual beings that collaborate with non-humans through technical activities and manifest their pre-individual potentials. If post-humanity if post -humanity were to be characterized as superhumanity, it should not be a reinforcement of human capacity to dominate non-humans, but trans individuality based on intellectual and emotional communication and cooperation with non-humans. Post-labor should be an embodiment of such post-humanity. Thank you, Professor Kim. Next, I'd like to invite Professor Hiroshi Yaka Yamakawa to give his presentation. Yes, okay. Yeah, you can, you can press the down button. Ah. Uh, thank you for invitation to this good, uh, good symposium, if rex. And uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, coming from the, uh, Japan yesterday, from Tokyo. And uh, I'm a, a kind of AI researcher. And uh, uh, maybe I, I can talk about the uh, progress of AI is uh, my first point. And second point is uh, that kind of uh, progress will have uh, a big impact to the human uh, labor. So I, I'd like to talk about that kind of things. So, but it's a uh, uh, little wider scope. So I start from the how to make harmony with human beings while building with AGI. Uh, here. Oh. Oh. Ah, okay. <laughs> ah, and uh, uh, this is just a uh, few slides and uh, uh, ah. I have a, uh, I have interviewed uh, about uh, half years ago, and uh, this is uh, called the Future of Life Institute. Uh, this institute is uh, very famous of the uh, thinking about the existential risk of the humanity. So uh, I have some. Uh, my article has a, a, a now is just the top of this recent news. So. Uh, 
My idea is uh, some part of my ideas uh, you can see in this uh, page. And Andrew, I have not so many time. And my first, I talk about my uh, uh, starting point of my research. Uh, when I was a, a doctor student, uh, I had studied. Uh, ah, sorry, I had studied uh, this kind of. His RL means uh, reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is a kind of related uh, value system in the uh, agent. Uh, in this case, human and many animals has a kind of agent in the brain. So we, I'd like to make the system that kind of things. This, in this case, here the, there are some, some samples. And uh, if there is some goal, you can put uh, some goal uh, to the distance from the goal is uh, my idea. This kind of technology is now used very uh, widely in the uh, machine learning uh, domain. And another uh, idea is uh, uh, this is called the neural networks. Uh, everyone knows that the uh, human brain is made by about many, many uh, neurons. So now the uh, neural networks is a very popular technique. And about 20 years ago, there are the second boom of the neural network. And I have studied that kind of things. And I have combined that kind of value system and the neural network. And I'd like to make the uh, human-like artificial intelligence about uh, 20 years ago. But it was far <laughs> at that time. At, at, but now, today, uh, that kind of human-like uh, intelligence, here we call the general purpose machine intelligence, it's uh, not so far. In this, uh, in this uh, figure, uh, from the Gartner's figure, uh, about 10 or 15 or something, more, 10, more than 10 years later, but uh, you can, uh, Gartner can write this here. And now the machine learning is just uh, go through the peak of the, uh, this wave. So this technology is very different, but now the, uh, this uh, general purpose machine intelligence is on the scope of the, uh, this kind of economic uh, activity. So I uh, shortly uh, explain about the AGI. AGI is the term, uh, ah, sorry. AGI is, uh, here's AI. AI is, uh, you know, the artificial intelligence. And G means the general. So AGI means uh, something like this. It's uh, this tec technical goal. It means it is not uh, in practice, but uh, it's the goal of technology. This technology is uh, 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 perform many kind of tasks like this. And today's uh, AI is uh, called narrow AI. It is already practical. For so example, chess, automatic driving, and many things. But it, that kind actually intelligence can do only single task. It's very different. And uh, today, the AI technology is gradually go this way. And this is a very big, uh, uh, big uh, issue in the AI area. If the, uh, this kind of actual general intelligence has uh, realized, uh, first kind of uh, impact has occurred is uh, this, uh, this shows. And uh, actual, actual general means the versatile, learning various problem, uh, problem solving capabilities from data. And this means the three kinds of impact. First, the development costs are lower than narrow AI. And second is uh, generalist AI can occur. It means, uh, of course, uh, for human society, uh, specialist and generalist is both are important for the social. So this is the important point. And if the versatile and uh, autonomy is combined, autonomy means exploring the world without being under other controls. 
So this is caused the robustness and creativity is a very important impact. And finally, this creativity is uh, uh, caused uh, uh, such as AI uh, researcher and uh, uh, AI can make uh, it, it itself. So recursively, AI uh, improvement can be done this creativity with artificial intelligence. So, at the, so uh, today, there are some uh, organizations, intuitive, intuitive or intuitive, uh, initiative is making, try to develop the actual general intelligence. This is the uh, <clears throat> map of about uh, 2014. At that time, uh, there are this kind of organization, and uh, uh, they, uh, about two years ago, uh, many organizations have started uh, AGI project. And uh, this year, uh, of course, uh, China has uh, said uh, this kind of thing. So, I think uh, something about the uh, impact of the actual intelligence for the job. Uh, this uh, picture is uh, written by myself, but idea is given from the uh, Robin Hanson's article in uh, 28. And uh, he said the uh, impact of the uh, job of the AI is uh, uh, two parts. One is the uh, sea level rise by the uh, sea of the machine, and uh, orgogenesis of the job mountains. And the uh, uh, important point is the uh, time goes, and now maybe now is around here, and uh, it is easy to use the, this kind of uh, scope. <laughs> we need no time to run to use the scope, but if you want to uh, design the actual intelligence, you need many time for training. So uh, the uh, change is uh, that this uh, wide of the uh, mountain is very narrow. So the uh, productivity of the, this part of the human is a very uh, effective, but Somebody's, uh, uh, somebody's professional ability is uh, uh, under this sea. So uh, uh, there are many uh, impacts of the artificial intelligence, but not so many times. Uh, I have talked about the uh, uh, recent uh, activity of the uh, AI uh, development. How to make the AI is a very important problem. This is the uh, beneficial AI conference in this uh, uh, head of this year uh, by Future of Life Institute. And here, the uh, 23 principle is proposed by about uh, 100 people. Um, of course, everybody does not uh, agree, but almost uh, uh, all, all attendants has agreed either of these 23. Uh, principles. And uh, uh, this, uh, I, I don't say uh, retail, but uh, sorry, but uh, uh, there are three parts uh, how to research the AI and ethical and value and long term issue. And um, I have uh, some, say something that this is important for the research, this should be avoided because uh, AI race is very uh, dangerous. And uh, uh, value alignment means that uh, we should make AI like human value. And the uh, last thing is the common good is that uh, uh, AI should be uh, developed and used for the everybody. And here is uh, some, uh, as I said, uh, recursive self-improvement is a very important point. Uh, as I said, this will sometimes cause uh, exponentially uh, speeding up the uh, development of the AI. So, last month, just this month, uh, this month, this month, uh, uh, next uh, symposium of the beneficial AI has held in Tokyo, and I attend this one. 
And uh, in this case, the cooperation of the older world is uh, emphasized. So uh, many uh, countries and uh, nations and many races and uh, many things, many people should be uh, had better to uh, cooperate and uh, join this kind of activity. Uh, as I said here, and uh, now I, I talk about something about the uh, development of the actual general intelligence by, the, uh, by ourselves. And uh, uh, as I said before, the, today the synergy between actual intelligence and neuroscience can uh, really realistic things. Uh, so two years ago, there are some uh, paper uh, special issue about the cognitive architecture. This is kind of architecture. It means uh, architecture that is uh, like a human uh, input from sensor and out from the hand or something. That kind of uh, cognitive architecture is a uh, uh, special issue of the uh, neuron. Does that mean this is a very neuroscientific journal? And in the same journal, uh, this is very famous, uh, the David Sasamis, uh, leader of the uh, Google DeepMind, has published the paper about the neuroscience-inspired artificial general intelligence. So, uh, as she said, in this case she said, uh, for developing the uh, human-level AI, uh, Neuroscience is very uh, useful because the, uh, they are uh, very inspiring and, uh, and uh, validating for the architecture and the algorithm is used. You can use now neuroscience. Because basically, because this is because uh, the neuroscience is uh, uh, also uh, progress very rapid in this 10, uh, 10 years. So we can use a neuroscientific uh, knowledge to develop AI. It's the stage. So now we are, uh, my, uh, I am a chairperson of the whole brain architecture and uh, we are uh, developing and uh, whole brain architecture. Uh, in this idea, uh, we are going to uh, build the AI like brain. So to do that, uh, we have, the brain has some part. Here is a neocortex, hippocampus, a basal ganglia, amygdala, or something like that. And we can implement like the brain and uh, combine uh, these parts uh, implemented by the uh, machine learning, like deep learning, and that are combined like the uh, brain architecture. Today, uh, brain architecture is uh, known by uh, many uh, experimental methods, so like a, a microscope or something like that. So we can do this kind of thing. We have uh, a more already knowledge of to do this kind of thing. So we can try to do this. And uh, as I said, generality is important for my human level inter intelligence. In the, our brain, uh, our brain is a very uh, big neocortex. Neocortex is around here, this, this neocortex. And neocortex can uh, have a many function, uh, sorry, many function, but they have all the same circuit, local circuits. It means the various functions are realized on the anatomically uh, uniform structure this is a source of the generality of the intelligence. So same, same unit can perform uh, many functions by uh, depend on the input, of, so input information. So uh, the, then we are, we are, uh, why we are doing this approach is uh, uh, first is the preventing divergence in the development by sharing architecture as constraints. It means uh, this is depend on the, our history of the making the AI. Uh, in the history of the AI development, many researchers make many architectures, but very diverse. <laughs> but now we can refer the brain at a reasonable level, so it is uh, good uh, refer the uh, brain. 
And of course, we can use the uh, utilization knowledge in the human science. Human science means uh, neuroscience, cognitive science, such as like this. And uh, in this approach, integration is done uh, not so uh, in the course of the development. It is a third uh, merit. So now we, uh, we started uh, initiative for this uh, activity two years ago. And uh, uh, now we uh, uh, try to make the, uh, try to make and more promoting the uh, artificial general intelligence from the whole brain architecture approach. In this part, uh, we are very uh, important to think about the creative world in which AI exists in the harmony with humanity. So uh, for this, uh, we should promote promote the open, open development. And uh, to do this, uh, the member of this activity should study and imagine and build. So uh, we'd like to do this activity on the open platform because today the uh, technology is around the AGI, uh, such as deep learning is uh, progressive very fast, so we cannot catch up so easy. And, and we can use the collaborative platform of the brain connector or pro uh, brain architecture. So we'd like to make the uh, harmonized AGI with human beings by democratizing AI technologies. So, well, well I don't say uh, detail, but uh, here uh, we have a uh, really uh, building a platform. Here is a neuroscience part in the machine learning part and combine and something like that. And uh, 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 I have, uh, uh, then uh, what whole brain architecture is trying to do as an NPO. Uh, this is almost last slide. <laughs> the, uh, our vision is, as said, that to create a world in which AI exists in harmony with humanity, and we should avoid the all benefits uh, taken by the somebody that has reached recursive self-improvement AGI fast. So uh, we should prepare so that many other people can catch up immediately after somebody completes the AGI. So open AGI development by diverse organizations will work as a preparation. So we think our WBAI would like to grow to be the one of that kind of organization while taking advantage of the future of learning from the brain. So at last, I show the image like this. So top group of AGI development is reached some goal, and we'd like to go just after that. Thank you for attention. <laughs> Hello. Can anyone? Tulishimika. Ne, Usan, Tubunke, Kamsadirimida.
디자인에 대한 가치 를 바꾸는 게 아닌가라는 생각이 듭니다. 그러면 어디까지 우리가 배워야 되고 또 그리고 어느 정도까지 이런 기계를 달리 설계해야 되는지 생각하십니까? So because I'm listening to, to, to Korean. And, uh, so regarding to your question of, um, of knowledge and design, I think that, um, well, the, that was the last point that I want to emphasize, because if we agree with the previous uh, speaker and also um, somebody, uh, Mark has said, the short-sightedness of capitalism, um, And this is a huge problem because it is only aims to to profit from mm -hmm. the, act, mm -hmm. the technical activities uh, of its users. Mm. Now the question is that: Is it possible to go beyond this paradigm, to go beyond these industrial models at all? And that is the question of design. I think for me. Um, uh, that, That is to say, um, if we identified in the current um, industrial models the, problemat the problems, for example, concerning consumerism, concerning uh, the problem of, of attention, um, even problem of politics, how will these new models, alternative models, allow us to have other imaginations? Now the question is, where are these alternative models from? We can only imagine these alternative models by through the cultivation of technological knowledges. And these technological knowledge, as I want to say, uh, emphasize, is not about how to repair an object and so on and so forth. It, is, it should be a knowledge that we see the combination from humanities and engineering. And The, only, the alternative models can only be raised if we can question, we can question the ontological and epistemological presuppositions of the industrial models. So this, uh, for me, is the possibility to, uh, uh, I, will, I wouldn't see the incompatibility between knowledge and design, but I rather it is what enables us to think further beyond. The current models. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, no, uh, I can't catch everything. But uh, you said uh, something. Uh, the relation, the uh, something like uh, two tools or human the relation is uh, this topic is okay. Sure. Uh, and uh, uh, in some uh, uh, discussion about uh, idle free or something like that. Uh, The responsibility of it is very important uh, uh, for kind of this kind of thing. Uh, for if, if the that AI is uh, uh, just the tool, uh, they have something like uh, they can't have a, they don't have a uh, like a target of the responsibility, but they have a, some uh, autonomy. Uh, there something can be the legal being. But uh, another uh, uh, concept is uh, but uh, in future, an AI and amplified uh, human being is very complicated relations. So there has some, some trouble, but uh, we cannot uh, specialize of what is uh, the but, uh, origin of the but uh, things. So, <laughs> we should have, we should sometime have uh, recognized as uh, nature that that is a, like a, a natural disease is <laughs> something like AI and the human complex uh, ecosystem makes uh, some uh, disease, but uh, sometimes it is uh, uh, we cannot identify the. Some uh, responsibility point or something like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, that kind of uh, uh, aspect is a very uh, important uh, thing 
about uh, 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 introduce the uh, AI or something like that kind of technology because uh, we cannot define something like that. The uh, many company cannot uh, pr produce uh, produce and uh, and make uh, and sell the product. It is uh, uh, if we, they don't understand, uh, they don't. Uh, that kind of thing is not defined. Uh, uh, company cannot uh, make the uh, more progressive uh, service or product. Uh, it, it's a very uh, big point, I think. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'd like to ask a more specific question in the same vein. Among the things that were said, you said that according to the law of principle and market, uh, the technology continues to be developed. And then how can you How can you not comply with the market rule or design outside the market? That's a very difficult question. You're asking how we can get away from the capitalist system itself. I don't think I'm really able to answer that question. What I talked about today is the possible forms of post-labor, and I define that as technical activity. Technical activity has a free, creative, and inventive attributes because uh, we can assemble, make, and experiment in technical activity. The characteristic of technical activity is to reorganize and create uh, heterogeneous uh, things. So it's a re-establishment of relationship. In the past, the technical activities were focused on labor in the industrial society. If we can break away from the, the paradigm, I think we can uh, arrive at the true nature of technical activity. At the same time, labor and leisure was uh, thought as a uh, dual thing. It was either or. But then there are things that are not work. But not leisure. There could be an activity that can be active and that produces something, but still not be labor nor leisure. It's not about being bound to productivity activity, but it's not. It's also not about doing nothing. And I think that is where we can find the answer. We can uh, refer to this as technical activity or something else. But this concept is a path uh, that we must find in uh, the post-labor era. Then uh, as a condition for post-labor, we are uh, mentioning technology, but uh, there must be political and economic system that allows this to happen. There were social prejudices. In other words, there are hierarchical orders. Uh, the, uh, the, for example, there was an order between manual workers and uh, intelligent workers, white collars and uh, blue collars. Uh, so this hierarchy can be reestablished as a new social condition. As a sociological condition, uh, this is not going to be easy, but because technical activity itself is not the idealist one that I'm talking about. It's a, if you look at the technical workers and the engineers uh, working nowadays, they are still bound by the laws of capitalism. And uh, many of the technical activities that we're talking about, it is only possible with uh, funding. So it's difficult to. Uh, answer this. But as a philosopher, I believe that we need to set a certain philosophical principle and the desirable way forward. Respond to what she has, she has said. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I think yeah. I have to, um, mm -hmm. I, I disagree yeah. with uh, mm -hmm. some of the readings of, uh, because I think technological or technical activity exists since 
beginning of humanity. The making of true uh, industrialization, and today we have all different forms of technical activity. It, we, we, they, they, there hasn't been a moment in history that we didn't have technical activity. I think this has to be clear. And one po the, 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 I think the, the question is here is that uh, what Simon Don has uh, trying to say is that uh, labor is only one phase of what he called genesis of technicity. So the, the category of technical activity is much larger than labor. So that is to say we can think beyond the question of labor together with the, condi the technological condition. Now what Simon Don says concerning the technical individual is that he saw that in, 19, in the 19th century there, were the, there was um, the, there was the emergence of what they call a technical individual, which is uh, automatic machines that replace human in, heat, in, in factories. And they call, it causes a psychological, psycho, uh, what we, we can say, a social psychological problem among the workers as well among the technical objects. While in the, in the time of cybernetics, remember that book was written in the 1950s, Simon Don sees the possibility of reorganizing the society according to what he called a technical ensemble. That is to say, with different uh, individuals, we can organize our society based on technology, so that is to say, to a way to integrate technology in our society. But here is the problem: is that uh, that Simon Don, of course, didn't anticipate the, the 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 situation we have today. For example, with a social network, with so on and so forth, uh, and um, uh, internet, and so on. And we have to put him in new perspective, I believe. Uh, so here, the that made the question of what you said, the technical uh, collectivity, or or. or um, uh, creatively, uh, it makes what you s said very blur, very uh, vague, and that we have to really to historicize this point. Now, the second uh, point I would like to, to make is that uh, I, I don't believe that there is a pessimism in Stigler's thought. I, he was my professor. I worked with him for 10 years, and we, we have been trying to propose new models to, over, to, to as a response to these problems. And if you say that uh, 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 the question is not uh, at all to overcome uh, capitalism, because in order to overcome capitalism, we have to define what is capitalism, and then first of all, you already have a problem. But as I said, that we have to identify the problems that we are facing in, 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 in our life. And in this period of, um, technological development because we have to know that in every technological, in every epoch of technological department the developments, there are always sources of alienation. There, there will be no uh, moment of uh, technological development without possibility of alienation. There are always possibility of alienation and we have to respond to this, to this question. And, uh, that, that is the question of politics. If I can continue uh, on, uh, what you first said is something that I fully covered during the presentation, and I find it to be the same. So you uh, reiterated uh, what I said. You well summarized what I said. I wasn't uh, trying to say that Stiegler was completely pessimistic. He thought that it could be poison and medicine. So there was a duality of uh, technology. But how we approach technology, how we perceive uh, technology, will determine uh, the direction. Simon Don overlooked the problems of information network society, and Stiegler elaborated on this. Uh, so that's why I contrasted the two. In terms of Stiegler, I also agree that he wasn't pessimistic, but he was more neutral. It was. Uh, technology has become more poisonous, but how can you make technology uh, function more like uh, medicine? That was what Stiegler focused on. Simon Don. 
was uh, a thought leader during the turn of the century when we were just moving to uh, the Information Society. And I thought uh, the thoughts uh, of Simon Don uh, were worth revisiting. Techno technical activity is, like you said, much broader than labor. And if you look at labor from Simon Don's point of view, in the past, labor was f the essence of people. Everything was considered to be labor. All emotional activities were also translated into labor as well. But I think we need to reduce the scope of uh, labor. We need to make sure that it's technology that reorganizes the relationships. At a time, people would use uh, their body to do things. And if we can reduce the scope of these kind of activities, we can place more focus on technology. And that will allow the relationship between human and nature to change rather than uh, dominating or be dominating. We can focus on making uh, this sort of inventive or adjusting activities and uh, making that the essential nature of people. So when we can reduce the scope of labor, uh, artistic and technical activities, as well as activities that can either be defined as a labor or Leisure uh, can also be negotiated, and uh, that is what I wanted to uh, focus on. Furthermore, uh, can I pose a question? I'd like to ask this question uh, to Mr. Yamakawa. Since I'm a philosopher, I would like to clarify the concept. My basic position is that AI or robots have already emerged, and we need to coexist with these new emerging things. And that's where the post-human society is headed towards. But I'm curious about one thing. I think you already mentioned this, but when you create AI, why do you emulate natural intelligence? Artificial intelligence is was invented uh, to be contrasted with natural intelligence. But robots are soft programs that represent artificial intelligence. Is does not necessarily have to follow the rules of natural intelligence because machines can be intelligent in their own way. But why do they try to emulate the natural intelligence? And I don't think it's even possible because natural intelligence and artificial intelligence are essentially different from what I know. Research on natural intelligence is uh, just starting. We really don't even know how the human brain works. But can we actually refer to the human brain to create artificial intelligence? It's hard for me to understand how we can do that when we don't know much about the human brain yet. I think that way of thinking assumes or misunderstands the way artificial intelligence works. So we can misunderstand it as working like the human brain. Automation and autonomy, I think, were intermixed. Automation is a concept that's different from autonomy. When AI developed into AGI, Automation uh, to place, but is complete automation possible? And it, can we c perceive automation as autonomy? Because autonomy is about making their own rule or uh, decision. AGI, can AGI create their own rules in how it 
operates and behaves? Do you think that will be possible? Or do you think that automation becomes more perfected and the function improves? Uh, is that what you're talking about when you're referring to autonomy? Uh, uh, maybe there are uh, some uh, included some questions. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, 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 the last one is uh, AI can uh, generate new rule or something like that. Uh, in that means, uh, simple answer, uh, the AI can uh, run a new rule from data mm. is a simple answer. Mm. But now, uh, it, it, well, now it's limited. <laughs> but, but, or, or because AI researchers want to make more flexible rule, uh, rule acquiring, but it's kind of the theme of the AI. And uh, uh, autonomy mm. is uh, your question. Uh, autonomy is a, a very ambiguous word. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so uh, I took many aspects. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I, uh, in my presentation, I say the autonomy about the uh, spontaneous mm. uh, search the world mm. in that meaning. Uh, that kind of uh, technology is now just in progress. Mm. And the uh, uh, technical uh, issue is uh, if the, uh, it is easy, uh, randomly moving the uh, robot, uh, but maybe it's not uh, ineffective. <laughs> just doing like something like this is not ineffective. Mm. So uh, searching the world means that uh, uh, if you go to do something, just like walking is a, and uh, shake the hand, and that kind of primitive action is uh, fixed. Mm. And combine that uh, action is uh, uh, used for more complex things. That kind of uh, 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 hierarchical system, how to make that kind of hierarchical system is uh, one uh, problem issue. And second issue is uh, if we try to everything, uh, sometimes it is dangerous. <laughs> so I'd like to try to uh, uh, go down from the higher cliff. If, of course, you can try. But so, uh, if you do that, you cannot uh, search another thing. You lose the chance. So the, uh, predicting the uh, self uh, my self defense, self uh, preserving kind, that kind of uh, and, uh, ability. And uh, what is a new thing in this world? And uh, trade, co uh, co controlling, controlling and balancing that kind of trade off is a second topic. Maybe it's a, a, a typical topic, and we have to solve that kind of problem for uh, autonomous system. And uh, yeah. <laughs> can I say, so. maybe we give the a chance to Jin Jung please. Uh, artificial in fact, artificial intelligence actually emerged in the 70s, not now. At that time, it was based on a rationalistic model, not about emulating the human brain. But that didn't work, so it went away for a while. Recently, it has revived because artificial intelligence was combined with uh, brain science. So they have adopted an empirical experience, a bottom-up of material. AI is actually following what the philosophers have been doing. First, it was a rationalistic model, and then it became an empirical uh, model. And nowadays, it becomes a phenomenal model. The, uh, For example, it deals with the five senses, as well as calculations. Uh, uh, the calculation that people find hard to do is very easy for machines, but what comes naturally to human beings like walking is very difficult for machines. Another thing is uh, the design principle. It seems to be a little bit different. During the industrial age, design it was about um, adapting 
people to machines, but now in the information society, it goes the other way around. So a mnemonic technology is not only applied to that area, but in other areas as well. The other issue is the issue of autonomy. I think you're a little bit confused here. The autonomy in machines and uh, the self-consciousness in strong AI are two different things. So that's why I asked about AGI. This is what AGI is about. Uh, Descartes interestingly said many interesting things. Uh, first of all, he said that animals were machines, and the human body is also a machine. But uh, humans are not machines because they not only have bodies but also have spirits. And that is something that machines cannot do. He cited two examples. Machines cannot use language or signs. Secondly, machines do not have a general use. Uh, machines can only be used for the specific purposes they were designed for. So that means that there's no universe, uh, there's no generality for machines. But Alan Turing broke this uh, thought because he made a computer that knew how to read and write. Also, the general use uh, theory was broken because software and hardware were separated. But the problem with the recent AI is that the program has to be done by humans at each time. Um, uh, of course, there are multi-coders that uh, are self-programming, but uh, this is just one step forward. Even if uh, AI emulates the human brain. Basically, it's nothing more than simulation. Uh, human beings understanding language and uh, the behavior of a being that understands a language is completely different from what the AI does. The existence uh, is uh, completely different. What makes, what really defines humans would probably be sex. Uh, is that possible? Sometimes when you are so precise, it becomes impractical. What's more important is that uh, people die. Humans are not based on silicone. It's based on carbon. And they die. That is the source of fear and happiness. Those sort of emotions are shared with others, and that's where communication takes place. Not only do humans have reason, but they also have emotions. If you have no emotions but just reason, then we call that kind of a person a psychopath. What you're saying is, is that until now people had to program machines, but will there be a time when machines are able to do this by themselves? Until now, machines just emulated the human body, proclaim machines or, or um, equipments was stronger than uh, the human body, but now are we able to simulate the human brain, not just the body? The amount of data interchanged between humans is surpassed by the amount of information interchanged between machines. A self-driving car becomes a problem because of autonomy, but what's interesting here is that this project uh, three or four hundred years ago was created f to serve uh, humans. Even if machines become autonomous, uh, they, I don't believe they will ever have self-consciousness. We are running late, so we can take about two questions from the audience. <laughs> the discussion is very uh, down to earth and uh, you have raised uh, good points. Uh, the title of our symposium is Superhumanity, but we have talked about labor and work a lot. And we have talked about how uh, humanity can design itself. Uh, we design something for the future, not just referencing the past. With regard to labor, Professor Chin, 
gave us uh, different uh, definitions of labor, the relationship between labor and play. And uh, Swandon, uh, the labor that Swandon is mentioning and labor that is defined by Professor Chin is completely different. But we have inserted the word design in it. And for seminars like this, uh, I think we have to think about what the participants and audience would like to hear. We have uh, people from uh, the art uh, sector, we have philosophers here. And so I think most of the people here would like to know how this connects with fine arts. But you have been talking about very technical and specific subjects. So it was a bit hard to follow, I think, for most of us. And uh, the I'm obsessed with the fourth industrial revolution and uh, autonomous driving and autonomous cars. What are we going to do in the future is what I'm obsessing about. And in the 1980s, uh, we talked about technology and we talked about man-machine systems for the first time. And... Uh, Experts uh, in the academia, uh, in uh, the humanities field, uh, they talked about uh, making the system. But now everything has changed. The man-machine system that we thought about in the 1980s is now completely differently seen. Uh, and we talk about automation technology and how to upgrade it. and. Uh, Artificial intelligence, intelligence becoming uh, automated, we never thought about that in the 1980s. It was the beginning of the computers uh, then. So I had a lot of fun following what you were discussing, but uh, what I want to talk about and mention is design. I would like to talk about design. None of you have mentioned design when you uh, talked, but it's something that's going to be there in the future. A trial and error is very important. And if we look back at human history, Industrial Revolution, James Watt developed the steam engine starting the Industrial Revolution. And then 50 years later, Carnot uh, announces the Carnot cycle. It's a theory. And based on that theory, uh, we were able to develop uh, different technologies and uh, the uh, internal combustion engine. And then based on that theory, we have new inventions. Based on these theories, we have new theories that appear. And now that we are uh, entering into the age of the fourth industrial revolution, uh, I think uh, it's important to talk about what existed in the past, because this is a philosophical debate. But uh, because we have so many insights on knowledge. Uh, in the following seminars, I'm sure you'll talk about it more. But I'd like, to, I'd like you to talk more about how we are going to design the future. Because uh, the problem of labor is very important for Korea. I mean, uh, Korea could succeed or fail depending on what it does uh, to its uh, labor system. So I would like to ask you to give us more insights on the future, on how we can design the future, more than talking about the past. In any case, it was a lot of fun just listening to you. Thank you. Uh, I can say a few things about that. Um, uh, first of all, I, I don't know, I'm not sure if we can design the future and whose future are we going to design? The future of humanity? What is humanity? When Carl Schmitt in the, in, uh, in, 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 uh, on the concept of the political, he says, whoever wants to invoke humanity lies, cheat. So there is no, I'm sorry that probably there is no future of humanity per se, but rather in what way can we think of the futures of humanity? Uh, that is to say, the diversity of future that we can imagine. I think that is more important than thinking of just one future of humankind, which will be, for example, many people say we are going to, uh, we are speeding towards uh, technological singularity. 
But regarding to what you said about um, the question of design, uh, I'm not a designer, I'm a philosopher. I can only talk to you about principle of design or the problem that we may able be, we should identify in order to address this question of design. Now, I may, uh, maybe I should uh, kind of, um, how to say, correct a little bit about the history of AI because that was my first degree. <laughs> The AI started in 1950s with the Dartmouth Conference, and that, uh, the, this history was started as uh, the simulation of the, human, of the human mind. That was the program of simulation, simulation of the human mind. And that you were right in the, in the, by saying that there was a kind of rationalist approach until the 1960s and 70s, when the philosopher Hubert Dreyfus proposed that this kind of AI cannot be realized through a Cartesian rationalist approach. And he proposed what he called a Heideggerian AI that become a, a, a big movement in the 1980s, uh, 70s, 80s to think of embodiment, emotion, and so on and so forth. Uh, and until the recent years, with, the, with um, the, the amount of big data of data that we have, then the question of AI comes back because they are, the data, data become a really a driven, driven force for this new round of AI based on data. Now here, I would like to link a bit of what you said about the fourth uh, industrial revolution because the fourth industrial revolution is not so much about technical objects, but about the environment. So we are actually entered into uh, uh, um, an epoch where all we see, we, maybe we can say the environmentalization with, the, with smart object. Uh, so, uh, um, and here is the problem. If you, as you said that before in the 80s, we are talking about human-machine relations. For example, with Likelider, the question of symbiosis. Uh, so that is to say the interdependence between uh, human and machine. Now we have to look at our situation today in, uh, politically, because it is the, the way through the environmentaliz environmentalization that uh, this symbiosis become a problem for us because it is a way of control. It's a way through the, modi the moderation of the digitized environments that the relation between human and technology, human and machine, has to be questioned. When I say, when I say this, it's because uh, where I, we can refer to what is the pathological, pathological for example, for Kungilem and for Goldstein at the time, that was a main reference for people in, also in human machinery uh, interaction, is that what is a pathological is the organism's lack of capa capability to cope with the environment. And I think that this, this becomes a major issue when we think of the, uh, that today we can, through the, mod the moderation of the digitized environment to control and to uh, organisms, which we say human beings. And this has to be, uh, we probably need a new design principle for that, it, so it is not a human machine symbiosis, but a new uh, design principle which is, as po is, which is political in a way, to allow us to break from this kind of uh, uh, environmentalization and control. 저 이제 시간이 많지 않아서 어, 질문을 이제 I'm sorry, but uh, we have uh, completely run out of time. So uh, if you have questions, please ask them tomorrow. And uh, uh, Professor Yuki talked about political engagement and uh, how humans can design themselves uh, when asking this question. Uh, let's uh, try to answer this question tomorrow. We will end this session now. Thank you very much. I would like to thank all the speakers and uh, 
I would like to thank uh, Miss Lee and uh, our uh, moderators. And uh, we have ended our program today. I'd like to thank all of you for staying with us until the end. Tomorrow, we have session two on psychopathology and session three on plasticity. And we will continue with our interesting discussions and debates. Registration is from 10 to 11, and session two will start at 11. Thank you again for coming. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.